Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to talk about whether Bitcoin has intrinsic value. It's a question that I've been getting a lot from you guys. So I thought I'd make a video about it. If you're interested in Bitcoin, crypto in general, momentum stocks, or just want to see how I'm trading these markets, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So the real question, there are many things that people mean by intrinsic value. So we're just going to kind of go through the different versions of it and talk about whether Bitcoin indeed does have intrinsic value. So the first critique you often hear, especially from people over the age of 50, is uh, how can Bitcoin have any value? It's just a bunch of zeros and ones, etc. Now, you would think that at this point in time, this wouldn't be something that, uh, that you needed to debunk. Uh, simply because where well, we used to get these critiques back in the 90s, you know, the internet's nothing, it's just zeros and ones, etc. Uh, and there's a famous, uh, famous article from Newsweek that talks about how online shopping is, is going to be, is never going to develop because you need physical stores. So this is sort of a cognitive error that people make thinking that because something has always been a certain way that it needs to be that way going forward. Obviously, uh, companies like Facebook and um, Facebook, Minecraft, Microsoft, etc., started off just being zeros and ones. Obviously, now the companies own buildings, they have customers, they have employees, they have sort of uh, they have brands, and they have intellectual property. But they did start off just as ones and zeros. And even if I wanted to, uh, I could create my own Facebook tomorrow but it wouldn't go anywhere because what Facebook really benefits from is something called the network effect where every person who joins it adds value to the network. It's similar to eBay. Why did people, uh, I don't know if people still use eBay anymore, but why would people want to sell their things on eBay? Well, because eBay had the most buyers. And why would buyers want to go to eBay? Well, because eBay had the most sellers. And so a lot of these modern companies, especially these digital companies, they really benefit from the network effects that they have. And as we'll talk about at the end of this video, Bitcoin certainly has a brand and has network effects as well. So obviously, digital assets can have value. You can have a website uh, that's just ones and ones and zeros. You can have a YouTube channel like PewDiePie, uh, just, just zeros and ones. But what he does is he has a fan base. He has more than 100 million subscribers. And that's where the real, the real value is there in the network effects. Now, obviously, PewDiePie can generate uh, revenue through, uh, through YouTube ads, and that's how he makes a lot of his money, including sponsorships. So we'll talk a little bit about cash generation later. But the next question would be, can an asset trade above its intrinsic value? So what's the intrinsic value of a $100 bill? Well, a $100 bill, according to the uh, Federal Reserve website, uh, costs about 14 cents to make. Now, obviously, it's worth a lot more than 14 cents. That's just the printing cost, the cost of the paper. It's worth a premium because it's uh, an example of a world reserve currency. It's backed by the U.S. government, whatever that means. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But here's a perfect example where we don't limit the value of a dollar to its intrinsic value, to the value of the paper or the value of the zeros and ones. It has value because of network effects, just like Facebook or Minecraft. There are lots of people who enjoy using dollars. Uh, options are another great example. Uh, out of the money call options, out of the money put options have no intrinsic value. They only have time value that's due, uh, that can be priced using black shoals and the volatility of the underlying stock or asset. But these are, this is a perfect example of a financial asset that has no intrinsic value, only extrinsic value, and yet you can buy and sell these all day long. And they are priced uh, using option models like Black & Scholes. Gold's another great example of something that trades well above its intrinsic value. So the, the actual physical uses of gold, obviously there are uh, uh, crazy finance people in New York City who, who uh, show how rich they are by buying, uh, this is the six, six, $666 douche burger, <laughs> that's what they call it, which is lobster, caviar, truffles, uh, and a beef patty wrapped in six sheets of gold leaf. Here's the consumption of gold. Uh, obviously, this burger trades for a lot more than uh, than the gold in it. It's There's some signaling signaling involved. Likewise, with uh, uh, there are, there are uh, 
industrial uses of gold. I think every every smartphone has some gold as well as some other precious and, and industrial metals. Uh, obviously, there's there's demand for jewelry, uh, though gold jewelry obviously obviously trades at a premium to let's say jewelry made out of plastic or jewelry made out of some some cheap metal. So a little bit it begs the question a little bit, but uh, and then there may be some medicinal uses uh, of gold, but gold certainly trades well above its uh, the cost to mine it and it it trades above its intrinsic industrial value as a commodity and as i'll argue later one of the reasons for this or the main reason for this is that gold is very scarce it has a stock a high stock to flow ratio likewise stocks um, trade almost always trade well above their intrinsic value so with a stock a stock like amazon we would define its intrinsic value as simply being the uh, assets, the total assets minus the total liabilities. This is sometimes referred to as book value. And you can see right now the book value per share of Amazon is $124 per share. But I don't think anyone would argue that there's some problem because Amazon's trading above the value of its, uh, uh, the book value on its uh, financial statements. Obviously, this is a very valuable company, also for its network effects. There are a lot of sellers on Amazon. There are a lot of buyers on Amazon. And it's just this behemoth that disrupts one in industry after another. So these are some good examples of, uh, of assets trading above their book value. Stocks trading uh, or above their intrinsic value. Stocks trading above their book value. Uh, the paper value of a dollar bill. Uh, the value of a dollar trading well above the, the value of the paper. Also, gold which is obviously a useful commodity, but it trades well above uh, its value as a physical physical commodity. And what we could say is that gold trades at a monetary premium. It's a form of money. And so it trades at a premium above what its, its simple uh, industrial uses. So then the question would be, well, of course, Amazon trades above book value because it's a valuable business. It has revenues. Uh, it has all these uh, assets, etc., and uh, you know it generates some sort of cash flow. Well, Amazon's not a good example to use because it reinvests, uh, or, or most of its lifetime, it's basically reinvested that cash flow. Doesn't pay a dividend to shareholders. Uh, usually, doesn't even pay taxes because it doesn't have any profits. They're very, they've been very clever doing this. Whether it's uh, ethical or not is another another debate. But here's an example of Amazon is basically one just one big network effect. It generates revenues, expend, it, it spends all those revenues, so it doesn't have to pay any taxes. Uh, but and yet, obviously, the value the company is very valuable, and its value continues to grow. And at a certain point, obviously, they could turn on the cash flow machine if they wanted to and start paying a dividend, and and uh, buying back a lot of shares. Right now, they're able to invest it in the business. So Amazon's a good example of a uh, uh, of something that trades well above its intrinsic value and yet has no uh, no investment cash flow There's no dividends or anything obviously there are other uh, scarce assets that do not create any cash flow uh, they don't pay a dividend they don't pay interest income but they're scarce and as a result they're very valuable now how much they're worth is is a function of market dynamics we let the markets prices so rare comic books, uh, looks like Pyrex cookware, old cereal boxes, whereas a box of the cereal probably used to cost 50 cents or 25 cents. Now it's worth, uh, uh, looks like some of these sold for $11,000. Old lunch boxes, old Beatles, uh, yellow submarine lunch, lunch boxes, comic books, uh, Star Wars figurines, Star Wars comic books. Now, why are these rare? Why do they have intrinsic value? Well, I suppose there's a certain amount of pleasure that a collector would get looking at this. Um, certainly, you would never let your kid play with something this valuable. So there's not really a practical value to it. There is a certain aesthetic value. Uh, but I would argue that the reason these things have value, any value at all, is simply because they're very rare. So I could uh, I could give you a modern Star Wars comic book that uh, uh, has much better graphics and maybe even the story's more interesting and more up-to-date, but it would have less value simply because it would be online uh, and infinitely copyable, or it would be um, part of a, a print publication where they're 
there are millions of, of copies available. And so it's not, not rare. So these are examples of, of items that don't have intrinsic value, but they have value because they're rare and because people attach value to them. And people also, uh, someone will work very hard at a job, they'll take their paycheck and they'll start to collect Beanie Babies or old Star Wars comic books or rare baseball cards. And then they will use that as a store of value, as a way, rather than putting the money in the bank or in stocks or in real estate, they'll, they'll have this collection. And then if they need something, maybe in their retirement, uh, if they need to buy groceries, Safeway or Whole Foods, does not accept rare comic books when you go to the checkout line. Uh, but you can very qu quickly convert these collectibles to fiat currency. You can take them to a comic book shop or sell them online. Take the US dollars. You don't have to hold on to the US dollars for very long and you can use those to buy groceries. Or you can convert this into, uh, you could convert these into euros or yen or Australian dollars or anything you want. Or you could actually, you could probably go find a farmer who collects uh, comic books and you could work out a sort of barter situation where you exchange uh, your a comic book for a certain amount of food. And so here's a very good example. These things don't have any intrinsic value, but they do have, uh, they have market value. They can be converted into fiat money. They could be converted. If you had enough rare comic books, you could uh, presumably even buy a house with them. Uh, these are some great examples of uh, expensive baseball cards, uh, selling two, three million dollars. Absolutely unbelievable. And I'll give you a historical example uh, that's in a paper. I got this from a paper by Nick Zabo. Uh, these are called the Rye Stones, and they were used on a couple islands in the Pacific Ocean as a form of currency. They were used as a store of value and as a medium of exchange. And the way this would work is basically you would say, I would like to buy your uh, your coconuts or your thatched hut or whatever it is, and I'll give you uh, this stone in exchange for it. Now, these stones were very big. They were not movable, but what would happen is everyone in the community knew who owned each stone. So if I wanted to buy your house uh, or something like that, I would say, I will give you this rye stone that's in this part of the jungle in exchange for your house. And then the, the chief and everyone would notice that uh, this rye stone had, uh, had changed owners. And uh, what made these valuable, again, was their scarcity. You could only get them from another island. They're very difficult to mine and transport to this island. And I, I believe what happened eventually is that uh, some white settlers came and started just mining these and bringing them in in big ships. And that ended up uh, completely collapsing the value of the um, of, of these rye stones as a store of value. So here's another example of something. These, these stones have no intrinsic value, but they're very useful as a medium of exchange and as a store of value. Now, someone else will say, uh, here's another uh, uh, critique as part of the critique of whether Bitcoin has intrinsic value. Well, the US dollar has no intrinsic value, or maybe it's you know worth 15 cents or something, but it has value because it's backed by a government. Now, this is a common misconception, and it confuses the different versions of money. So obviously, in the U.S., there's only one form of legal tender. The U.S. government has a monopoly on, uh, on the currency, or it thinks it does. And it does to a certain extent, uh, where if you try to start your own money or print your own money, uh, or if you try to counterfeit money, uh, you can get in a lot of trouble. And uh, the gov governments like having control of their own money. It's obviously a very, very powerful, uh, a very powerful tool. Uh, and you also have to pay your taxes in U.S. dollars. The IRS, as far as I know, or the Treasury doesn't accept. You can't send them baseball cards, etc. So the, the, there is a legal tender in the U.S. It's backed by a government. And it's very useful as a medium of exchange. US, you can take US dollars anywhere in the world and uh, you can use them for legitimate purposes. You can go on a European vacation. Uh, you can also use them. You can go, to, uh, go somewhere and buy cocaine with them or do something illegal. Everyone accepts and loves US dollars. They're, they're, um, again, you have network effects surrounding this just like you do have network effects for, for Facebook and Amazon. So it's obviously useful as a medium of exchange. On the other hand, you can also uh, 
as many people know in California and Silicon Valley, you can buy a very nice house using your stock options or using your stock. Now, there is an intermediate step here where you convert them into dollars. You sell your, uh, you sell your Facebook stock. Uh, you briefly convert it into fiat currency, into US dollars. Or maybe you convert it into you uh, convert it into yen and buy a, a, a property in Japan. You convert it into fiat, do fiat dollars, and you can then you can buy a house with it. And so you basically you've held it as Facebook stock as a store of value, and then you can briefly um, uh, theoretically you could you could probably buy someone's house in exchange for a chunk of stock. And I'm I'm sure this has been done, and that their title and real estate companies that would allow you to do this. But this is often a critique of, of Bitcoin that you can't, uh, you can't buy anything with it. And let me, uh, you, actually, you actually can buy, Microsoft accepts Bitcoin from any of their products, uh, Overstock, and this list of online stores that accept Bitcoin uh, will be growing over time. Obviously individuals accept Bitcoin. And I think if we get a adoption, you'll be able to buy a car using Bitcoin, buy a car using, um, buy a house using Bitcoin. And especially younger generations have gotten very easy, very comfortable using things like PayPal and Venmo and other services like this, where they are denominated in dollars, uh, but, but it's really zeros and ones that, uh, that take place online. And here's a, here's a funny example of a guy uh, obviously, in the uh, in the illicit underworld, uh, bags of cocaine, bags of marijuana, uh, function as a form of money, as a store of value. Here's a guy in Oregon who tried to uh, use marijuana to buy a car. Obviously, uh, not a good idea, even in a state like Oregon, where marijuana is legal as a recreational and medicinal uh, medicinal drug. But this is just to give you an example that you don't need the government to tell you something. Uh, to, to say that something has value for it to be useful. And uh, during the shortage right now, I'm sure you could use, uh, during the, uh, we're still in the middle of the coronavirus as I'm recording this, you could, use, uh, you could use toilet paper as a form of currency. It wouldn't be a great place to store your wealth in the long term, but right now I'm sure you could uh, exchange toilet paper for uh, a six pack of beer or for, for uh, for food or for bottled water, for whatever you need. And so when people say you need something to be backed by the government to have value, obviously you don't. And the confusing thing about money is that it has all these different uses. It's a medium of exchange, which is very nice. I don't have to figure out how many apples I'm gonna trade for a chicken. Uh, it, it, as in a barter system, I can just trade my apples for US dollars and then use my US dollars to buy chicken. I could also do that using Bitcoin as well. Now, the problem with the US dollar, the government does have monopoly, monopoly on it, but they're printing them at a very furious uh, furious pace. And this is one reason why the US dollar loses purchasing power over time. When I was a kid, a Big Mac cost about 50 cents, now it costs about $5. And so you cannot store your wealth in US dollars uh, simply because they keep printing more of them and so they become less valuable, just like the rye stones we talked about, just like gold. If Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos could go into outer space and bring back a comet or meteor that was full of gold, it would uh, it would tank the price of gold in the uh, in the world simply because gold would not be as scarce. It's beautiful as a form of jewelry, but it's really the scarcity of gold that makes it valuable. I could make synthetic gold and make some very beautiful jewelry, but it would trade it a, a fraction of the value of the real uh, real gold. So the problem in the modern, modern world is how do we store value? How do we pass it on to the next generation? If I have, a, if I have 50 cents today and I know I can buy a Big Mac in it, how do I ensure that I can, I can save that 50 cents and 20 years from now use it to buy a Big Mac that will then cost $5? Well, this is the problem. Where, where do I put that? I can't put it in a savings account. Uh, won't earn very much interest income. I can't put it under my mattress because it won't retain its value. 50 cents uh, back then does not buy you a Big Mac today. I could put it in stocks, but they go up and down. Sometimes they go to zero. Uh, I could put it in real estate, but then there are property taxes associated with it, etc. This is why gold is such an interesting solution because gold is scarce and it has functioned as a store of value over time. 
I think the saying is something like uh, an ounce of gold over time has always bought you a really nice men's suit for the last few hundred years. And so uh, uh, it, it retains, it's one way of retaining its purchasing power. Uh, it's a way of storing wealth and passing it to your descendants or passing it on to your future self. And this is the problem with government fiat money. They keep printing more of it so it is not a good store of value. So it's very ironic when people say that Bitcoin doesn't have intrinsic value. Uh, U.S. dollars do have value, but what the government does is they print a lot more of it, and so they debase it, and it, it's almost like picking your pocket through inflation. Uh, here's an example of you can, using gold to buy a house. Uh, I haven't read this article. It's probably technically uh, possible, but all you really need to do is you can sell your gold, sell your stocks, uh, sell whatever, sell the products of your labor, and use that to buy things. Now, Bitcoin has many advantages uh, over gold, and we'll, we'll go into those advantages in a minute, uh, but I find a lot of gold bugs who don't like Bitcoin, which is strange. Most of these people are over the age of 45 or 50, and uh, what many of them don't realize is that Bitcoin is the new digital gold, and that most millennials and most Zoomers or Generation Z know about Bitcoin and, and other crypto and are much more interested in, in it than gold. And there, there are good reasons for this. Obviously, we live in a digital economy. Younger people are much more comfortable with digital assets. But Bitcoin is just better than gold simply because not only is it scarce, it's even more scarce than gold. There are only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever made. Uh, gold, we could develop new mining methods. There's a lot of gold deep in the earth. We could bring gold from outer space, as I said. So gold is not quite as scarce as Bitcoin. It's not nearly uh, as scarce. Uh, Bitcoin is more easily divisible. You don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy, it's divided into, I believe, uh, 100 million Satoshis. So you can buy a piece of a Bitcoin. Gold can also be divided, but it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit more tricky. Uh, it's also trickier to transport gold. You need to insure it. You need to put it in a, uh, a secure truck. If you store a lot of gold in your house, you're really a target uh, for thieves. And if you want to, for example, if you want to leave China with your gold and come to the US, very difficult to do that. And so Bitcoin is, is very nice for moving money across borders, uh, for uh, sending money anywhere in the world. And so here's an example where Bitcoin uh, has both, uh, both functions as a store of value a way of storing wealth and passing it on to your future self, but also a way of, uh, also as a medium of exchange or transferring value across the world. It's very cheap to send it anywhere. Uh, you can't be censored by any government when you send it. And then when you receive your Bitcoin, it's very easy to store. You can store Bitcoin in your head if you know your private key. Um, Bitcoin cannot be confiscated. It's fairly easy for the government to come to your house with a bunch of people with guns and take your gold or, or other thieves to take your gold. Bitcoin cannot be uh, confiscated. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a digital asset and you can store it in your head. You can store it using various solutions. Uh, you can store it on a hardware wallet. You can store it using multi-sig. So it's, it's much easier to store. And uh, theoretically, someone could put a gun to your head, of course, and demand your private key and take your Bitcoin that way. But short of that, uh, it's much, much uh, has much more utility than gold as a medium of exchange, uh, as a store of value, as, as, as a way of moving value from different parts of the world to other parts of the world. Bitcoin also has a very good brand, uh, uh, especially among the younger generations, as we said. And this brand is in, intimately tied up with its network effects. Facebook has a brand because of its network effects. Coke has a brand because of its network effects. But what a lot of people don't realize, they're always asking me, what is the next Bitcoin? And the answer should be, Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin. It has the first mover advantage. It has the Lindy effect moving, uh, working for it, which means that the longer it's been around, the more likely it's going to be around. And it's also uh, what a lot of people don't realize, and in addition to being a scarce digital asset, it's also a protocol. And so as, as it has all the advantages of a protocol, like the email protocols, or the internet protocols, HTTP, uh, TCP, IP, is that um, when you have a protocol and it becomes widely adopted, 
there are lots of network effects that surround it. You have uh, developers, programmers, you have the Bitcoin miners, you have the exchanges, you have investors, you have new generations who understand the brand of Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin as a protocol is, is intimately tied up with its value as a network of people, a network of people who like to transact with each other and store their, uh, their accumulated wealth in Bitcoin. So these are, these are some of the arguments you can use against Bitcoin not having intrinsic value. And you just have to remember that Bitcoin is the first truly scarce digital asset. If you have an online image, you have an online book, it's very easy to copy it and distribute it. You can obviously pirate an online movie and distribute it. Uh, and so uh, uh, these things are not scarce assets, but Bitcoin cannot be counterfeited and uh, it has its own protocol for verifying whether in fact it is the real thing. So there are only gonna be 21 million Bitcoin. A bunch of these have been lost, maybe three or four million have been lost in addition to Satoshi Nakamoto's original Bitcoin, which are locked up and really haven't moved. If you wanna read more about Bitcoin and its network effects, the famous, uh, the famous talk or essay was done by uh, Trace Mayer. So I'll also link to that. So hopefully you found this helpful talking about Bitcoin as intrinsic value. I think Bitcoin has a lot of potential moving forward. I think it'll be trading uh, in the hundred thousands and in the millions of dollars per Bitcoin over the coming decade. You can check out my other YouTube videos if you want to learn more about that or ask me a question in the comment section below. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Also, uh, you can check out my courses online if you're home and you have a lot of free time. I do have a course where you can follow my Bitcoin investing and other crypto investing, as well as uh, bear market trading strategies, learn to trade stocks like a pro, learn to trade options like a pro. Uh, if you're interested in futures trading, I have a course on that. And you can get access to all of these courses for a fixed monthly tuition. It's just $125 uh, for, uh, for 30 days access. You can watch all the courses and cancel at any time. There's no, no long-term contracts or anything like that. And I want to give you a special coupon code as well, because I know financial times are, are hard for the country and hard for the world. So if you click in the link below, in the description notes below, you'll go right here and you can click get it now for the monthly tuition. That'll take you to this page. So normally $125 for each 30 days. If you click here, have a coupon code, just type in YT99, click update, and that will take $26 off, so just $99. Gives you access to all the courses. You can watch all 12, 13 courses um, uh, and then cancelable for 30 days and you won't, be, you won't be charged again. But I'm constantly adding new courses and new lectures. And if you have an idea for something you'd like to see added to the website in terms of uh, new stock trading strategies or more about Bitcoin, whatever it is, you can request it and I'll record some new, new courses and lectures as well. Hope you guys found this useful. Hit that subscribe and like button. And I uh, hope you're all doing well, staying healthy and staying sane. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.